how do you kill green star polyps? Oh, don't growl at me. I was at the point of pulling up my hair and there should really be a support group for people like me, like underfeeding anonymous because it's a real problem. We need to go back at least five years to really tell the story of the Fluval M60 tank. Five years ago, 2015, I was living with my family. We had just come back from living in Hawaii and we were living in this, in this dank two bedroom apartment in Seattle, Washington. I was working at the Hyatt in Bellevue at that time. I was in between teaching jobs and I had decided I was going to finally pull the plug and build a saltwater aquarium. So I scrimped and I saved and I put my tip money away. I ended up buying the Red Sea Reefer 170 from my local fish store. And I didn't just buy like the Red Sea Reefer 170, but I bought high end gear. I think I had the Ecotech XR15 lights. I mean, crazy expensive. I had the, I bought an Ecotech MP10 pump. I bought multiple media reactors. I mean, this wasn't like a budget friendly build for a first saltwater fish tank. This was a high end build for a saltwater fish tank. The Red Sea Reefer 170 sat empty for quite a while because I just didn't have enough money to complete it. So I would buy piece by piece. I would buy the live rock. I would buy dosing pumps. I'd buy whatever I thought I needed at the time. And I would just put it in the tank or in the sump and it would just sit there. And so it sat for about six months before I was finally able to get it cycling, get water in it and start buying livestock. Some of the first things I bought for that tank, which were my absolute favorite at the time and still are my favorite were Euphelia. I bought several different euphelia colonies, not frags. We're talking back in the day when for some reason people didn't care about euphelia. And this is the day when you could buy whole colonies for under a hundred dollars or a big colony for just over a hundred dollars. So I bought several of these beautiful colonies. My favorites were always frog spawn and hammer. Although I do think I picked up like a couple torches as well. I did a lot in this Red Sea Reefer 170 over the years. And here is a picture of this tank in its prime. At its very best, this is what it looked like. It was gorgeous. Anemones, euphelia, acans, livestock. Well, it's about this time when things started going south for the Red Sea Reefer 170. Well, what was the problem? What caused the tank to go south? It was me. I mean, 100% honest. It was me. I was meticulously anal about keeping things clean to the point where I just destroyed the tank. I ran quintuple the amount of GFO to make sure my phosphates were at complete zero. I made sure my nitrates never registered anything by keeping feeding to an absolute minimum. Was there a messy sand bed? Nope. I would step in and I would clean that sand bed. Not only would I gravel vacuum the sand bed, but I would do it in such a way that caused gigantic dust storms and just upset everything in the tank. If I thought a coral looked unhappy for whatever reason, I would immediately tinker, change the flow, change the lights, the intensities, the schedules, change the placement. I mean, I couldn't keep my hands out of the tank and I was my own worst enemy, but honestly, I thought I was doing what was best. I was wrong. I mean, obviously I was way off base. What was the problem with the tank? It was me. Life at work was super busy. So green hair algae started taking over. I started really slowly and then it grew and it grew and it grew. So green hair algae slowly started to creep in and take over the entire aquascape. I'm sure you guys know this, but if green hair algae takes over too much, it starts growing around the corals. My corals started to retract and they started to recede and were incredibly unhappy. I went from these beautiful coral colonies with polyps super extended and a large growth area around the stony base to pulled in tentacles and to that growth area shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until it started to recede and you couldn't even see that growth area anymore. The green hair algae was definitely winning. Along the way, I committed an untold number of mistakes. The pistol shrimp I bought that I thought would pair with a goby was the wrong kind of pistol shrimp. So that pistol shrimp never paired. My green star polyp colony, which is supposed to be the easiest coral in the world to keep, shriveled up and died. I mean, how do you kill green star polyps? I, I, I did, like 
I don't know how it's possible, but how do you do it? <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, but they died. My clowns took to this leather coral. It was a somewhat decent sized leather coral and they took to it and the leather coral did not like it. And the leather coral would slowly shrink over time, over time, over time until it completely died. When I was on a vacation, I had this beautiful acan colony. It was this red acan colony. Well, evidently I didn't secure it on top of the rock work. I didn't glue it down. I didn't use any sort of epoxy. So of course a snail tipped it over while I was on vacation and the whole center area died. Well, that spelled the end of that because then the polyps around it just slowly started to recede and die as well. The green hair algae problem just kept growing and growing and growing to a point where it had completely dominated my rock work and it was so deeply embedded that I couldn't get it off you know I couldn't I couldn't use tweezers my fingers didn't work I was at the point of pulling up my hair and I had no idea what to do not even close to an idea of what to do so I decided to break it down to sell everything and to scale back and start again with something smaller and something easier and I ended up going with the M60 which was a 24 gallon overall 18 gallons in display with a rear filtration chamber of six gallons and I thought this would be the perfect fit it was smaller there was no sump I could do less tinkering. It was an all-in-one system. I bought it with lights. I bought it with the turn pump. I bought it with protein skimmer. And my goal was just to make it simple. So I started right back in it. I started with a few small corals, some things a little bit different, some things a little bit the same, and a couple fish. And sure enough, what happened? The green hair algae came back. It came back really quickly, even though it was a brand new tank and a brand new system, totally different rock, it came back again and it started growing and growing and taking over my aquascape. I had to break down the tank again, and not because I was sick of it, although I was getting there with the green hair algae problem, but because my family moved. We left Seattle after a decade and we moved to Southern California, to the Palm Springs area. This time I was gonna do it right. This was take three and I was gonna get it right. When I set it up this time around, I changed a few things. Number one, I changed the lights. I went away from the stock Fluva lights that it came with and I upgraded to a 24 inch Reef Breeder Photon V2 fixture. I also got rid of the skimmer. I didn't find the skimmer to be helpful at all and I didn't seem to really get any sort of decent skimmate from the Fluval skimmer. So I got rid of that and in its place, I just built myself a custom caddy using black egg crate, which I still use to this day. And I made a few different levels so that I could use sponges or filter floss and carbon packets. After I set it up, I went through a whole bunch of different salts just to try it out. I believe I tried the Live Aquaria Reef Salt and it was fine, but I ended up switching from the Live Aquaria Reef Salt over to Instant Ocean. And then from Instant Ocean, I went back to my favorite, which was the Red Sea Coral Pro. And I did that just so that I wouldn't have to add any sort of dosing pumps to the system. One of the first purchases I made was a huge mistake. And you can just tell my naivete or my lack of knowledge and the fact that my local fish store told me it was a good idea to put them in a 24 gallon tank kind of blows my mind to this day. But I bought three Liar Tail Antheas. Super gorgeous, completely wrong for a 24 gallon tank. I mean, obviously I should have known better, but I didn't. Put them in the tank, quickly realized that, oh my gosh, they needed a much bigger tank, a 60 gallon, a 70 gallon, a 120 gallon system to really thrive. So after a few days, I picked them up out of the tank and I took them back to my local fish store. I went ahead and went with pretty much the exact same rock I'd use. It was just some sort of eco rock. I don't remember if it was a Marco rock or an Aquamax dry rock. Around this time, I think my Instagram was, was growing quite a bit. I started around this time and it went to 1,000 and 2,000 and 3,000. And an East Coast local fish store reached out and we worked out a deal to buy some fish from him. So bought some fish from that local fish store that came home. But I do remember there was a dotty back and I thought that'd be perfect. And I thought I'd finally made some good decisions about these fish. Dotty back seemed totally fine. The next morning I go out to the tank and it's dead. And there's a Nasaria snail eating it. I have no idea what happened, but it's like the tragedies just kept coming for this tank. Then something new happened. I bought two or three, I can't remember, two or three rose bubble tip anemones. They were small, very small, and they were gorgeous. And I had not had a lot of luck. My previous tank up in Seattle in the Red Sea Reefer 170, I had this beautiful anemone, gorgeous, big, seemed to do really, really well. And then over time, just started shrinking 
and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until it died. I have never had luck with anemones in the past and to this day I hadn't. So I was like, okay, this time I'm doing it right. I set up this tank correctly. I using quarantine processes. I'm keeping my hands out of the tank. I got it, I got it. So I bought these three rose bubble tip anemones and I got them in there. Seemed great. I mean, uh, a week later, Instead of two or three, I had four. A few weeks after that, I had five. I had six, I had seven, I had eight. I think at, at the end of the day, I was up to something like, like 12 rose bubble tip anemones and they had long tentacles and I thought I was killing it. I was like, man, I'm doing so well. Yeah, anemones can split when they're unhappy, but I just figured, hey, no, they're not unhappy. They're thrilled to be in here because I'm doing such an amazing job. It was short-lived. So as that anemone colony was, was growing and expanding and getting more and more, and me thinking I'd hit the jackpot, I added a few more things. I added a tiny acan frag. I think it had two heads on it. Wait till a little bit later in this video when I show you that acan colony today. I also made a purchase from a buddy of mine who's a wholesaler, and he hand-selected for me a whole bunch of euphelia. Not frags, but, but two, three, four-headed pieces, also one wall, frog spawn coral, I mean, just some beautiful pieces. And I took these and I dipped them and I put them in my quarantine tank to inspect them and just to make sure they were super healthy. And they were gorgeous. I mean, I got these things for a steal, you know, just for, for, for a few hundred dollars for these, these beautiful colonies. And, and they spent their time probably about a month in the quarantine system, didn't see any pests, didn't see any die off, and they were ready to move into the new reef build. I also decided to add some cleaner shrimp, but I figured, hey, you know what? I was gonna try a peppermint shrimp. I had heard that they sometimes go after corals, but I figured, you know what? I'll give it a shot. They are so much cheaper because around this time, the prices for like your Hawaiian skunk cleaners or your blood red fire shrimp we're just going up and up and you could still pick up a peppermint shrimp for like five to seven dollars. I thought things were going really, really well in the tank. Coral growth was happening. There was really zero nuisance algae. Everything seemed to be thriving. And it's around this time that I noticed the peppermint shrimp, I call them the devil shrimp, started going after my euphelia coral and almost completely destroyed one head. I mean, I think I have a video of it that I'm showing right now. Just went after it. And luckily I was able to frag off that head and I moved it into a quarantine tank. And it's since grown back and I put it back in there. But I decided at that exact moment that it was time for the peppermint shrimp to go. So I think I moved it into the quarantine tank and then it eventually <laughs> died. For whatever reason, coral growth started to slow and virtually disappear, just like it had in my previous tanks. The one exception to that rule was the Acan colony, which had two heads, then four heads, then eight heads. For some reason, the Acan was in the perfect spot and was just thriving. But all the other corals, they weren't necessarily dying, but you could see their white growth rim just shrink and shrink and shrink to where there was really almost no growth at all. Well then boom, gigantic cyano outbreak. I am a notorious underfeeder and there should really be a support group for people like me, like underfeeding anonymous, because it's a real problem. I am so worried about nuisance algae that I underfeed, which is a terrible idea and I'm getting better. I promise you I'm getting better. But there was this gigantic cyano outbreak and I tried to use a natural approach to get rid of it. You know, what did, what did I do? Lots of manual removal and I upped the flow, but this just took over. I mean, look at some of these videos and pictures. It was completely covering my sand bed and completely covering my live rock. So it was time to break out the big guns, which I don't like to do, but it works for me every time. So I got the chemi clean, I added it to the tank, I followed the instructions and what happened? Of course, it disappeared. The cyano disappeared and I felt successful. After that outbreak was gone, or around the time of that cyano outbreak, I added a pistol shrimp and a yellow watchman goby. Thought it was gonna be awesome. Made some cool little Instagrams with them as they found each other, they burrowed together. I was like jackpot, but I noticed something wrong. I noticed there was some weird thing going on with, I forget if it was the upper or lower lip of the yellow watchman goby, and it just progressed and progressed and he stopped eating and eventually died. Well, around this time, something amazing happened that I've never seen before and I have not seen since. My hammer coral laid eggs. No joke. I had no idea what was going on. I looked at the hammer coral, I looked at the polyps, and I saw 
all of these weird looking dots. And sure enough, you know, this, this wild harvested hammer coral laid eggs. And it was the coolest thing to watch because you could watch these eggs and its polyps work its way towards the mouth and then eventually go out into the tank. So the rose bubble tip anemone colony had grown. And I think at its height, I counted around 12 anemones. I added a couple clownfish at this time. I think they were just a couple true percula clownfish, one larger, one smaller, and they took to the anemones, which was great. But the larger one just started this campaign of picking on the smaller one to the point where the smaller male clownfish found this, this little tiny rock area underneath by the sand bed and wouldn't come out. Just terrified all the time. And anytime that little fish would poke its head out, the larger female would just go after it. I had to move that smaller clownfish into another tank and that clownfish is still super happy now currently in my 40 gallon breeder tank. But it's about this time that the rose bubble tip experiment that I thought was going fantastic started going south. Every single one of those anemones started to shrink and shrink and one by one they disappeared and they died off until the point where I had three and then two and then one and then none. My hands off approach didn't seem to help. Maybe I overfed them, maybe I didn't have enough lighting or maybe the fact that I always feed my tanks too little meant there just weren't enough nutrients in the tank. I don't know, but my record of destroying anemones seemed to just continue. And it was so frustrating because it's not like I didn't know what I was doing. I had spent tens of hours on forums, on, on reef to reef, on YouTube videos, on speaking with anemone breeders and picking their brains. I remember picking their brains at Magna and picking their brains at Reefapalooza and following their advice to a T and yet still not having success. And it was so frustrating, not only because of that, because I knew some people who just had the most basic cheap tank and it was super messy and super gross inside and they were thriving. I mean, just thriving. Well, I mean, that should have been the thing that told me the answer right there. I was still doing too much. I was still demanding pristine conditions because of my irrational fear of nuisance algae. Well, around this time, I also picked up a toadstool frag and a really small random SPS. I never do SPS, but this really tiny SPS frag. And I glue the SPS frag on. The toadstool I put into the quarantine tank and I left it there for about a month. It came on a, on a piece of rubble rock, but there was aptasia and other things on that. So I ended up cutting it off of that and using a rubber band to attach it to a new piece of rock before I put it in the Fluval M60. And then they started growing. Finally, I was having some success with my acans, with my one SPS coral, which was growing. It was an encrusting green SPS coral, and the toadstool started growing. And then I still remember this. One day, I looked into the tank, and I was like, what the heck is that? It was an amphipod. I had never had amphipods in my tank before. I had copepods, really small little things that you see, you know, crawling under grass, but this thing was huge. And it started out, I just noticed a couple, and then I noticed a few more until the population of the amphipods in the tank just exploded. And, and to this day, I think the reason my tank has finally settled in and I have found success is due in large part to these amphipods. Not only do they scour the rock work, but they scour the sand bed. And I just think that they are such a great cleanup crew and eat a whole bunch of tiny pieces of waste and detritus and food and really help keep things clean without me having to do anything. Success started happening and I think it's because I took a total hands-off approach. I even stopped using a gravel vacuum on my sand bed, which for me was crazy. I just let the cleanup crew work and I didn't fuss about it. I added a conch, I added saria snails, serith snails, hermit crabs, and I think together with the amphipods, they just did their job and I didn't have to mess around with it. Not only that, but I didn't worry about algae growth in the rear filtration chamber. Normally I would like, oh, it's so unsightly and it smells bad, but I finally realized that if I let the algae grow in that back chamber, guess where it's not growing? It's not growing in my display tank. And so this ended up working really, really well. Well, after two years of living here in the Palm Springs area, the tank, the Fluval M60 mixed reef tank has finally settled into place. Okay, I'm super sorry. I fully intended to make this video everything about the Fluval M60 tank, but I have been editing this video for 20 hours 
<laughs> it's just too long. It's just way too long. So I'm going to have to break this video up into two parts. So check back next week for the second part, which is all of the equipment and all of the livestock. You don't want to miss it because you're going to see the before and the after. If you like this video, please give this a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Marine Depot and My First Fish Tank. And as always, happy reefing, everybody. We'll see you next time. Be well.